self-indulgent, selfish creep. <laughs> That's what we like. Creep uh, is interesting. It's interesting because uh, not only uh, Owen Flanagan, but uh, Lange Milgram has used the very same term. He told me it's become a technical term in philosophy to describe certain things to people like me, I suppose. Uh, thanks. Uh, well, the reason that I am such a creep is that, of course, I was perverted by the arch self indulgent creep, Friedrich Nietzsche. And what, how that came about is the following Nietzsche is, uh, has always been known for having not at all. So said first we have leisure and then philosophy. <laughs> uh, Nietzsche was notorious, I'd say, for having a totally insane view. That insane view was that uh, he supposed to have thought that the world repeats itself infinitely many times in exactly the same way, over and over and over again. It's done that already uh, infinitely many times and will do it again infinitely many times. And I always thought, uh, with other people too, that, you know, that even for an insane person like Nietzsche, that was too insane. Uh, so I tried to give another interpretation that I thought might uh, make much more sense of it. And I think I have something that I don't think it's the only correct interpretation. Well, it's certainly the best there is, but that's an <laughs> uh, Which says something else. It says not that the world or your life has already had, you have lived infinitely many times before in exactly the same way as you're living now and you do exactly the same things infinitely many times in the future. But it says something else. It says if you were to live again, without committing itself, in fact, not, there's no reason to think that that would ever happen. If you were to live again, your life would have to be exactly the same as it has been already. That's a very powerful word. For one thing, you can see how it is anti-millennial and anti-Christian and anti-religious in many ways. What it says is that you don't have a second chance. That's it. If you were to continue to live again, you'd be in exactly the same position. And the question is, why does he think that? And what on earth, what, what follows from it? Well, Every one of us thinks that there was something that you did at some party when you were 16 that was really, really embarrassing. <laughs> and that you wish you hadn't done it. And that if you were to live again, you'd like that terrible moment to be absent. Now, that's what we say, but in fact, we, are not, we can't be thinking just that. We have to be thinking something like, instead of this, I should have been doing, or I wish I had been doing something else. Because if you say, I just don't want to have done that, then what you might have done instead, because you're now leaving a, a blank space in, in the story of your life, that blank space that would, a space that would be filled by something, what would be filled by? Could be filled by something much worse. <laughs> so that's not very productive. You want to imagine something that you think is not as bad as what you did, or better, or very good, or whatever. Um, but my point is, and I think that the quotes that Professor Schachter put up really helped me to make the point. My, my, my sense is that the reason that Nietzsche thinks that this could never happen, that if you were to live again and you were at that party when you were 16, you'd do exactly the same thing again. Because, in fact, you won't at that point have the knowledge that you have now. At that point, you're still the person that you were when you were 16 and did the stupid thing that you did. Right? The reason that this is, this has to happen, in my view, is that the, the event in question, its nature, its significance, are given to it by its relationship to, its relationships to everything else about it. So that if you were to change that, you'd have to change the thing that came right afterwards, when well, the person you did the stupid thing to slap to you or laughed at you or whatever it was. Uh, and that would have changed something else again. And of course, if you were to have something, would have had to change in the antecedents of that because uh, something else had to happen before that, so you wouldn't be in the position to do what you actually did. And of course, that would affect, as Alex Wallop will tell us, everybody else who's involved in that story. <laughs> and in fact, Nietzsche says, if anything was different, everything would be different. You can't have any kind, you don't have any atomistic uh, events in life. Everything is interconnected. 
Now, that's a very strong view. I think there are different ways of looking at it. But a way that uh, uh, Elijah Milgram, for example, characterizes the view that he discusses in his paper, uh, David Wiggins' view, is that, uh, in a way, you want everything that is important in your life to be such that you wouldn't want it to be different. That is the point that Nietzsche is making, that an ideal of life is to have, it, uh, to have it be so that you wouldn't want it to be different from the way it has been. It's a very difficult thing, and I think it's really, really uh, almost impossible to accomplish. But nevertheless, Nietzsche seems to think that he did, because in his autobiography, his intellectual autobiography, I know, he starts out by saying, I'm 44 years old today. He said, what an amazing year. In fact, what an amazing uh, three months. I wrote four books or five books or whatever. And so I'm grateful to my whole life. Because my whole life was what allowed me to come to this point, not just this, that, and the other. And the idea here is that, indeed, there is, if we're going to become conscious of something like that, we do need to tell a story about ourselves. It's not the story itself that makes the life that way. The life may or may not be that way, but you do need to tell a story because unity, it seems to me, unity is a feature much more of narratives than of things. It's narratives that have unity, and the self that pro is produced through a narrative is a, a narrated object that, in my view, has to have a very serious unity, and a unity that is given by bringing things together and showing how they fit with one another. <coughs> so that is one, one, one issue that I'd like to bring up. Um, now, in, when I wrote the book, I, I said at one point uh, that oh, the past can't change, it's there. The only thing that can change is its significance. And I'll tell you uh, in a moment what I mean about that. I wasn't quite right. Uh, at the very least, it's not only significance that can change. In other words, I don't think that we can assume that a past event, whatever it is, uh, is absolutely over once and for all. Which, of course, depends on that event having an absolutely determinate beginning and an absolutely determinate end. It started then, and then it ended then, and that can't change anymore. I don't think that's right. I think that where, where we take, or where we take a thing or an event to begin, and where we take it to end, depends very much on our interests, on what kind of narrative we are going to incorporate it in. And I, I unfortunately, I couldn't bring this wonderful uh, quotation from Ian McEwan, who in the beginning of his book called, um, I think, Eternal Love or something like that, has a terrific paragraph which says exactly, he says, I can't tell you exactly where this event that brings all the events of the story in started, the, the, the beginning is always, in that sense, conventional. Not conventional in the sense that yeah, it, it's conventional. It, it is dictated by our interest of what kind of story it's going to be incorporated in. For example, I ask myself, when did I write, when did I start writing my book on nature? Well, one way I tell the story is to say that um, um, I had to give a lecture in a class uh, of my old teacher, and I had to lecture on the eternal recurrence. And I wrote this lecture on internal recurrence, which I liked. And then I gave it to some friends of mine to read. And they said, yeah, this is a nice thing. And so I may have begun it the day I gave that lecture. Or maybe the day before when I was preparing it. Or it could have begun, in another, from another point of view, when I applied for a fellowship and gave them an account, a proposal, which, of course, I had no idea would have anything to do with uh, the book that came out. That's when I started. Or maybe it started the day that I sat down and I said, now it's going to uh, to um, go to write the first sentence or the first chapter or whatever it is. But that would depend again on what I wanted to make of that particular situation. It, it isn't given, in other words, when it begins and when it ends. Um, when it ends. So, sometimes, of course, it is significance that changes. For example, in Eke Homo, uh, which I mentioned uh, just before, you might forget that water bottle. Uh, <coughs> for example, in, in Neke Homo, Nietzsche says at one point, um, he says, uh, you can see how harsh I am on scholars. Um, and he says, that's because I was one, I know it. I, I know what scholarship is. And then he says something very strange. I had to be a scholar too, he says, for some time. I had to be a scholar too. Why did he have to be a scholar? What does that mean? I had to be a scholar too. Well, um, 
What it means is not that he was obliged to do it or was compelled to do it or that he was forced to do it. He did it, actually he did it because his teacher thought he was brilliant and gave him a chair at the age of 25. He had to be a scholar given, in other words, being a scholar was necessary for him to have become the kind of philosopher he eventually became. Without having learned about philology and how to read words philologically and how, how he says, with forward and backward looking all the time, uh, repeating our imagination and, uh, and uh, memory uh, case from before, uh, he wouldn't have been able to write the kind of things that he did. So it's in that sense that it was necessary for him. His, his philological background was important for the kind of reading and writing that he did. At another point, he says very interestingly that uh, out of every three days, he said, he only had one good one. Because the rest of the time he's had an out of every four, something like that. He was had those horrible migraines and he was vomiting constantly and he couldn't eat anything and he hurt and he couldn't he, the light destroyed him and all that. But what does he say about it? He said he says that taught me how to write quickly. <laughs> it taught me how not to do treatises and to write aphoristically, basically. And, and there's another wonderful place where he says, I treat uh, deep problems as I treat cold water. Cold baths. In quickly and out quickly. <laughs> the cold water makes one think, uh, fast. Those who don't appreciate that says that they're not the friends of cold water. <laughs> they're the friends of hot water. Um, so, in fact, it's absolutely right that the horrible migraines that he had could be seen as something that made his writing and his philosophy much better than it would have been otherwise, because I don't know what it would have been like if he'd written treatises like The Birth of Tragedy of his life long. I think it would have been pretty awful. You know, what we have is absolutely wonderful. And if, in fact, it was that his migraines had to uh, do it, so much better. And he thinks so too. And he won't say, in other words, before he started writing that way, those migraines were simply an unfortunate event. They were simply suffering without any purpose, any meaning. Once he sees that they are connected with the fact that he writes the way he writes and that he is pleased with the way he writes, then it's not that they don't hurt. They still hurt as much as anything. And if he had to live his life over again, which he's willing to do, and go through the same pain and everything, he'll go through the pain and be very unhappy. But he no longer regrets them. He no longer says, I'd like my life not to include them. He wants precisely his life to include them because they give him, together with the writing and the other things about him, they construct what he thinks is a beautiful life. So here's an event who starts out as being near suffering, disease described only in organic terms, and all of a sudden it becomes part of a much larger event, <laughs> his uh, writing the kinds of books that he wrote. So, to move a bit with an, an obvious, uh, with an obvious connection, but I will move anyway. Um, I found what Professor Schachter both said this afternoon and wrote in his, in his uh, 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 book on memory, um, especially about the formation of memory by the putting together, so to speak, shards of recalled experiences together in a coherent manner. He says, uh, you know, think of it, of memory as di different pieces here and there, and that's what you have in mind, and then you write a story, so to speak, in which all these function. Um, I found very, very illuminating. But as he also points out, and again he pointed out this afternoon, there are all sorts of ways in which our memories are inaccurate to our past. In what sense, then, can we say that if I wish for the eternal recurrence of my life, um, I'm facing my real past, right? I may re recall my past in completely inaccurate uh, ways. That seems to be a serious problem. So, are we working on our past when we say, oh yeah, you know, I would like that to happen again, or I would like that to happen again, or simply on our wrong recollections of our past? And if it is the latter, if it is the wrong recollections of our past, how can we ever be confident in saying that we would want our whole life to be repeated? When in fact, what will be repeated won't be what we remember, right, but what actually happened, which is very different. Well. Apart from the fact that, as Professor Schachter argues, we are actually quite uh, uh, much better at recalling important events of our life. He has three hierarchies, three steps in a hierarchy of very long uh, sort of periods of our life, important events, 
and then individual particular occasions. And the argument is that we are pretty good at that intermediate level. We remember those things pretty well. <coughs> but consider the following. Suppose that I remember uh, uh, what I consider a very important event in my life wrongly. Since it is important, that event will have lots of connections, implications, and influences on the rest of my life and my other views and my other experiences and so on and so forth. It is, I want to say now, that event as remembered, not that event as it nearly happened, that plays a central role in my life. Whatever the original event was, what matters to me is what I remember of it and what influenced that memory, such as it is, plays or has on the rest of my life. And although I may be wrong about the original event, that is now no longer central or important to me. I want to have, what I want to say, well, if I say I want to be the same person again, I'm saying I want to have the experiences that are involved in that event. And whether the event is as I remember it or not, I'm perfectly willing to have it occur because whatever it was when it occurred, it brought about the particular experiences that I'm actually using in the rest of my life to make something interesting or whatever out of myself. In other words, I want to have the experiences that involve that event are repeated. And whether these are correct or incorrect memories, it seems to me, doesn't matter at all. Because it is they, not the original event, which would also happen again, anyway, and again, and again, and again, that uh, are playing the same interval in my life. So, I do believe that it's important to give ourselves an adaptability. I have some very heretical views about plots that I will leave for the discussion, Professor Keane. Uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, 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 a plot enemy. <laughs> but uh, what I'd like to say, sir, about uh, just to close off, I'd like to say that you'll hear, especially from, I think, both from uh, Owen Klein and from uh, Elijah Milgram tomorrow, that we people believe in things like that. Uh, you know, you heard what we are. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so because when I speak, and I do speak about that and can talk about it, of, of, running, of, of living one's life as if it were or could be a work of art, I do not mean that we should try to put it in a genre like tragedy as, as Leitch describes the question of, of Oscar Wilde or comedy or whatever. I think what we're, trying, what we're doing when we are trying to live our life as a work of art is to make it unified. It's this unity along with the ability that a life may have to increase the range of possibilities for human life that makes it an artistic accomplishment rather than a you know, practical or whatever. So we'll stop there and I hope we can talk about it more in the discussion. Thank you very much.